Okay, so welcome to my talk. Uh, to those who don't know me, I'm Maciej, I'm Torsten's uh, PhD student, and I'm going to present uh, one of the projects that we finished last year, with, which aims to provide better understanding and speed ups in graph processing. So as you all know, we have these huge, large photographs that we would like to process in a, in a fast way, with the use in, uh, for example, in, in machine learning, in rankings, in other, many other different workloads, and we run them on many different types of machines that have, I mean, you know, also use them in biological computations, we run them on many different machines that have varying levels of parallelism, but they are kind of inherently similar in a way that they all are parallel machines. Now, and now these computations that are processing these graphs uh, have a couple of inherent features, like they are, for example, highly irregular, they are data-driven, they are communication synchronization heavy, and we would like to understand them better and thus provide some higher speed-ups. Right, so let's take a look at, at the, one of the most well-known things that we have in graph processing, which is page rank. Uh, so we have this one graph, and we would like to compute the ranks of the vertices that model the websites. Right? So to have the understanding on which website is in some way more interesting or more important than others. Let's now mag magnify this graph a bit, and we have a part of this graph here. We have vertices, we have edges, these guys model the websites, these guys model the links. And uh, for simplicity, we assume that we have as many threads as the vertices, but of course, in practice, we will have some threads responsible some, for some parts of the graph. And now what we can do in this page rank to compute the actual ranks is, is one approach called the pushing approach. So this is what we know already. Uh, for example, this guy can can update the ranks of its neighbors by doing by pushing some some of the local data to the shared state in these guys. This guy over here can also update the ranks of its neighbors by pushing the, the updates to the to the state of the neighbors. And as we can see, we have some right conflicts here, right? So so we have some some conflicts that are happening in these guys because the updates are coming from, from this vertex and this vertex. On the other hand, we have the pooling approach in PageRank, in which we, these two guys can update uh, their private state now by pulling the updates from, from the shared state of the neighbors and doing some local computations. Right, so we have no write conflicts. We have some read conflicts, but those we don't really care that much about in practice. Right, so, so this is what we know, and now let's take a look at one more example that we also know, um, which, is, uh, which is the BEFS. Right? So it's, we have our breadth for search traversal, which we use to traverse large graphs. It's used, for example, in Graph 500 benchmark and a way to discover the structure of many, many, many large graphs. And in this algorithm, we pick some root vertex, and then we traverse all the vertices by proceeding in a synchronized way, uh, marking the vertices as visited, potentially computing also the distances from the root. And these guys that are currently being processed, they, are, they kind of form the, the thing which is called BFS frontier. Now we just proceed in this way until we mark all the vertices as visited. Uh, and now what we can do, we also can apply this pushing or pulling dichotomy in this, in this, uh, in this context, right? So we can do it once we, uh, when we expand the frontier, which means when we, when we analyze what are the neighbors of these guys sitting in the frontier, right? So in, in the pushing approach, what we can do, we take these vertices in the frontier, and again, we have our threads sitting on each of them, and then uh, this guy is going to update its own neighbors the same for this guy, and again, they, they will mark them as visited, but we can again have these right conflicts. Vice versa, in the pooling approach, what we can do, we can now process all the unvisited vertices in the remainder of the, of the graph, looking for our neighbors that are currently in the frontier, which would mean that we are now being processed for the next frontier. Right? So for example, this guy can be the first one. It doesn't have any of its neighbors sitting in the frontier, so will not yet to be marked. The same happens for this guy here. And now for this guy, uh, it detects one of its neighbors being in the frontier, so it marks itself as visited. Right? So again, we have no write conflicts because it's all happening locally. Same happens for the other vertex and some, same happens for the, for the last one. Right, so, so again, we have this kind of pushing versus pulling approach. And now uh, we have a couple of questions, right? So like the first question, can we apply this dichotomy to other graph algorithms? What are the formulations of these algorithms that we can apply it for? And like the third one is, is there some kind of deeper theoretical underpinning of this whole thing, pushing versus pulling? And then how do they differ in complexity as well as, as in performance? And so let's now first focus on these two first questions. Uh, let's take a look at triangle counting, like one other very simple example. We, what we have, we have again our graph, and this, this time we'd like to count number of triangles uh, 
but also in such a way that we count number of triangles that each vertex is a part of, right? So for example, this vertex is a part of four triangles, this is a part of the two triangles, which kind of gives us a different way to rank these guys. So this one is a bit more important than, than this one here in terms of this matrix. Uh, right, so what we can do here, we, to compute this, this triangle count, we have some, let's take a look at some simple pseudocode, and we have the input, our graph G, uh, and the output is the array of triangle counts TC of, from 1 to N, where N is the vertex count. Right? So we have TC for triangle count for each of the vertices. And now we take as, as our input the, the graph G, uh, and then we have some legend here. So these symbols that are going to be shown later, we, we can read them here. So first we initialize the triangle count to zero, zero, of course, for each of the vertices. And then we iterate over each vertex in parallel, which will be our set of vertices. Um, and then we have two inner loops that iterate over pairs of neighbors. So for example, for, for this guy here, we iterate over, over these three possible pairs. And if we detect that this given pair has an edge between them, this means that we found a triangle. Right? So we found a triangle in this case and we update the triangle count. And this we can do either using the pushing or the, or the pulling approach. And so in the pushing approach, we, uh, we again update the state at different vertices, again generating possible conflicts. Uh, in the pulling approach, we again do this pulling the count to our local state and, and updating the local counter, which again results in no conflicts. Right, so it's, it's, it's a pretty trivial, trivial example, but it does give this intuition that, okay, we can actually apply it to other graph algorithms. And now let's take a look at something a bit more complicated, namely between the centrality, the algorithm due to Brandes. Uh, what we here do, we also measure the importance of vertices, but this time we, this, this importance is based on how many shortest paths are going via each of the vertices. Right, so for example, if we consider this guy over here, it will have two shortest paths from either between these two vertices or between these two vertices going via this guy, right? So it has some importance in this matrix, but this guy over here doesn't have any of these paths, so it's poorly zero. Right, and now this formulation is a bit more complicated, so we'll not really go in details over this guy here, but we'll just take a look at some intuition. So what happens in this algorithm is that we have two phases for the whole thing. In the first phase, we have so-called forward traversals. So we basically what we do, we do concurrent BFSs from each of these vertices, gathering some structural information about the graph. Right, so we pick this guy as the root, we do the BFS traversal. At the same time, we also pick this guy as the root, we do the same type of traversal, and we do it for every other vertex, gathering some information as we go. Um, right, so, and what is, what we are actually interested in specifically is, is first the intermediate predecessors of each of these vertices uh, in the shortest path from other vertex, right? So we'd like to know for each of these guys uh, what is the vertex that is my direct predecessor on the shortest path from, for example, the root, uh, right? And of course, we also want to compute the shortest number of shortest paths between every two vertices. Uh, so for example, here we have source, we have destination, and again, we have these three shortest paths. So we need to update all this information as we go in the first forward traversal phase. Right, the second part, backward traversal, what we do, we accumulate the centralities because now we have all the information we need to actually compute all these centralities. We are going now to, again, do BFS traversals, but from the leaves of the previous traversals. And as we go backwards, we'll traverse these guys backwards and recursively update the state to arrive at, this, at the final centrality metrics. Right, so for example, in this example intuitively, uh, now these, the leaves of the previous traversal become the roots and we move backwards to the root. As we go, we update the state for each of the vertices. And now we can actually do the pushing and pulling in both of these phases. So let's take a look at, uh, at one of these phases, namely the backward traversal. We'll skip the forward one for, because it's also a bit involving. Uh, like in the pushing, like before, we, what we do, we have our threads, we have our vertices sitting in the frontier, and we again update the state of our neighbors, uh, generating the right conflicts. But in the pooling approach, we can actually do something similar to BFS, because we can again iterate over this unvisited part of the graph, but this time, because we did this traversal before to cover the structural information, we don't really need to iterate over all these vertices, we actually enough to iterate over only the guys that are sitting right next to the frontier, because we already know who is sitting next to the, next to the frontier. And so we can, we can compute the final metrics using only this part of the graph. Okay, so let's take a look at the third example, which is graph coloring, uh, that we can use to, for example, I mean, the goal is to, again, 
assign some number which you can see as a color to each of the vertices uh, in such a way that we have a minimum number of, of colors assigned and we don't want to, to the neighboring vertices, for the neighboring vertices to have the same color. Right? So we want to only have, if the vertices are neighbors, we want to have different colors for them. And this we can use, for example, in some scheduling problems. Um, and what we do now is that we need to actually, in this example, care explicitly about the graph partitioning. So now we actually care about how the, the graph is partitioned ac across the different threads. So this is like the left partition belonging to, to this thread on the left, and the right partition belonging to the thread on the right. And we also care about which vertices are now sitting at the border of the partition. Right? So which is, what, are, what, are, what are the vertices that have the neighbor directly on the other side of, uh, of this partition here? Right? So we have these border vertices, we have these partitions. And now what we do in this algorithm, we basically iterate until convergence happens where the convergence means we have no conflicts in the coloring, right? So it's pretty generic. So what it means in more detail is that in each iteration, in phase one, we color each partition independently. So for example, here we assign some colors. We also assign some colors on the right side. And as we can see now, we have some conflict, right? So in the second part of the iteration, we fix the conflicts. And this we can do either in the pushing approach by saying uh, of, of this guy, for example, look, you fix the conflict for me. and the conflict is fixed. Or we can also apply this pulling approach where, where the vertex here is, is fixing uh, the problem by, by itself. Right? So there is, again, no, no conflict. You can, you can choose these guys, for example, with some simple <laughs> randomization scheme. Uh, so again, the same thing. And now it turns out that we can apply this, this way of viewing these algorithms to also many different ones. So in our, in our project, we apply this for, to, to BFS, to centrality. Uh, to Borufka minimum spanning tree, to delta stepping for computing shortest paths, and to, yep, basically that's it, and you can check all these things in the, in the paper. So we have answered our first two questions. Uh, basically, can we apply this push-pull dichotomy to other graph algorithms, and what are the formulations? Well, for the first one, yes, we can. We developed in total seven algorithms and considered the total of 11 variants of them, and for the other one, we, we have all these things in, in the paper. <coughs> So now let's take a look at the third, which I personally find like almost the most interesting one, which is what this dichotomy really is. Is there some deeper understanding of this thing? Right, so we tried to, to answer this question and to maybe provide some cool theorems, but unfortunately we really failed in this, that, that there is something very simple, but I still find it kind of cool. Uh, so let's take a look at first some, some symbols. So we have our vertices in the set V. And we have this notation of T R O V if only if thread T modifies vertex V. And we have this notation for T bracket V if a thread is the owner of V. So if this vertex V is in the partition belonging to thread T. Right? And now it turns out that uh, algorithm uses pushing if and only if there exists a thread and there exists a vertex in V such that this thread uh, modifies this vertex and this thread is not the owner of the vertex in this partitioning thing. Right? On the other hand, we can use the pooling if and only if for all the threads and for all, all the vertices, uh, if this thread modifies this vertex, this means that this thread is the owner of the vertex. And now the, the cool thing is that actually this is the actual uh, logical dichotomy. So if we take the negation of the first one, we'll get the other one. Okay, so now uh, the third, yes, so, so the answer to the questions, of course, uh, that they can be described with the actual logical dichotomy. The fourth one is how they differ in, in the complexity. Right? So we'd like to gain some more understanding and if there is any difference in, for example, the PRAM complexity for, for these two variants, pushing and pulling, of each graph algorithm. Right? And before we move to this analysis, let's take a look first at, at a small recap on, on the PRAM models that we used in this part of the project. Uh, so PRAM is a well-known model that we use to reason about the performance of all programs in theory. And in this model, all processes proceed in log steps, right? So all of them do some simple thing locally or, or communication to the memory uh, by reading and writing, and they all have to wait for each other before they proceed far. Right? So it's a very, very simple model. But it can be used to gain some understanding into these matters, right? So we have our threads, we have our, our timelines, and some shared data, for example, a vertex in, in the shared memory. And they read this data or write to this data. And then we have the lock step. Then again, there is some communication happening acro uh, across all these processes or a subset of them, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And now we have two variants of this model that we consider. The first one is CRCW PRAM, which allows for concurrent reads and concurrent writes to take the same to the same cell taking O of one time. Right? So we can write to the same cell in, in constant time and read from the same cell in constant time as well, which is very simplistic. It's kind of the most powerful of these PIRA models. Uh, so we can basically do any, any type of accesses to a given memory cell at an O of one time at in a single lock step. And now there's the other variant, which is kind of CREW, the only one that can also read aloud as crew model. Uh, and this allows only concurrent reads to, to, to happen to a single memory cell, and it prevents concurrent writes from happening at the same time. <coughs> so we can only read in one, from one memory cell in one lock step. Right, so, so now the cool thing is that uh, in this trying to derive all these complexities for all these variants, we were able to use some very primitive, uh, some very primitive operations as the basis for the derivation of all of these complexities. Right? So we basically took the so-called k-relaxation and k-filter primitives, and k-relaxation is an operation in which we simultaneously propagate updates in pushing either from k vertices to one of their neighbors. So if k is equals force, k equals four, and if you have our, our graph here, we apply some, some, some propagation from four vertices to one of the neighbors, and possibly apply some function, and the pulling, we do it uh, in the other direction, right? And uh, so we can think about this of this of this uh, primitive as, as a binary tree reduction, more or less. And then we have k filter, that is a simple operation in which we just extract which vertices were updated in one or more of the k relaxations. And and now it it turns out that we can apply these primitives to obtain the complexities of all of these variants. Right? So what we wanted to do, we wanted to obtain the complexities of the Cartesian product of time and work. And, uh, and pushing and pulling variant of uh, used for both the CRCW and CREW model times also each of these algorithms we considered in, in previous parts of the project. Right? So, and plus a couple of other variants that I will skip here. And we did obtain all these complexities, but no worries, we don't have to take a look at this right now. So we'll just take a look at some, at some most important highlights. Uh, so first, let's take a look at page rank. Right? So we have our page rank, we have pulling and pushing approaches. We have time and work. We have time and work in, in, in pushing in CRCW and CREW. And for pulling, we don't dis distinguish between those two because they are, they are the same across these variants. And here, L uh, refers to the number of iterations. M is number of edges of the graph. P is the processor count. And D hat is the max degree in the graph. And now it turns out that, um, sorry, it turns out that, uh, that that for the pulling and, and pushing in CRCW, these complexities match, so they are really identical. Uh, this was the case for most of these iterative graph <laughs> algorithms that we, that we have here, like PageRank, for example. And so the work is the same and, uh, and the time is the same. For the pushing, pushing differs from pulling in, uh, in both the metrics by the logarithmic factor, which, which stands here for the fact that we cannot really do these parallel writes in, a, in O of one time. Right, so this is kind of the result that tells us, look, the only difference for page rank is that only, is only coming from, from these parallel writes that we have to do in, in pushing. And then there is a different class of algorithms that has somewhat different, somewhat different differences. Uh, so for BFS, again, we have our diameter. Uh, so this time we have also diameter. We have, again, number of edges M, number of processors P, and the maximum degree in a graph. And it turns out um, so that in the pooling approach, which is in these two upper parts, we, are, we have the complexities depending heavily on the diameter. So uh, while in the pushing approach, we don't really have, uh, I mean, we have this diameter, but to a lesser extent. And the point is that now in the pooling approach, we do have more of these excesses that are not really depending on only the fact that we do have these parallel writes. So the highlights are that uh, in the write conflicts, uh, pushing entails more write conflicts. So we have these write conflicts like we saw before in the page rank example that we must resolve with locks or with atomics. On the other hand, uh, pulling removes these atomics or locks either completely, like what, which is the case for triangle counting, page rank, BFS, shortest paths algorithms, and MST, or it also changes the type of the conflicts from floating point conflicts to integer conflicts, which is kind of also good because it means that we can, for example, use uh, hardware atomic operations uh, that operate on integers and not some logs that, that we have to use for, uh, for most of floating point operations on most architectures. Uh, in terms of the number of memory accesses, pulling in traversal 
in travel stars like such as BFS entails more time and work as we seen uh, in the complexity analysis. Because again, we have this kind of part where we need to iterate over all the unvisited vertices, and this generates more uh, memory excesses. Right, so we have our part three, how do they differ in complexity, where it's kind of, there is no clear answer, uh, because it depends a bit on the variant of the algorithm, but it's, mm, this we can, again, summarize with this couple of statements. And then the final part is, what is the actual performance, right? So a couple of sub-questions, like, is pushing or pulling faster and when and why? Or what is the impact of the programming model or environment? And also, can we develop some strategies for generic performance improvements across different variants of, the, of, a, of graph algorithms? And so we'd conduct the performance analysis on a couple of machines, a couple of Cray machines on, on the CSCS supercomputing systems, and also did some comparison also on some simple Intel server for, for cross-checking. Uh, we considered a couple of types of graphs, including synthetic graphs and uh, reward snap graphs. And also we counted uh, events using the puppy library, uh, including cache misses, reads, writes, branches, and TLD misses, and also did some analysis on our own that is not supported by puppy, uh, which is issued atomic operations, acquired logs, and some remote operations. Right, so let's first take a look at some simplest plots. So we consider graph coloring. We do it for a couple of snap graphs uh, using the shared memory on Cray systems, on the Cray XC30 system. And here in each of these three plots on the x-axis, we can see the iteration count. So this is this kind of iteration-based algorithm. Um, on the y-axis in each of these plots, we can see time per iteration. And for now, let's focus very briefly on these two parts, pulling and pushing, and forget this, this phi FE4 for, for a couple of seconds. So we do see that in this graph color we have some consistent differences, uh, namely pushing is, is slower, uh, is faster than pulling. So, and these three plots are of course done for three different graphs. So we have the Orkut social network, live journal social <laughs> network, and the road network. Right, so again the highlights, pushing is faster, uh, we have fewer reads writes, this is the information gathered from the puppy counters, and fewer cache and TLD misses. So now we have this question, okay, can we have some strategy for gaining more performance across, uh, across this one particular variant, for example, either only in pooling variant or in pushing variant, but of different graph algorithms? Uh, can we have this strategy for more speedups? And here we have this uh, one strategy that we call Frontier Exploit, in which, for, namely for graph coloring, we start with some assignment of one color to some quickly computed subset of vertices, and then we do in a more like BFS style traversal where we consider the neighbors and we color the neighbors using as few colors as possible and proceed like this uh, across the whole graph. Right? And this strategy uh, has some interesting performance improvements in this graph coloring. We have fewer iterations, quicker convergence in some cases, and also we have fewer reads and writes. So now before we move to the part that deals with distributed memory, let's have a brief recap on the, on the mechanism that we used for this part, namely for RMA. So in the remote memory access programming that we used for, for programming the same, these things uh, on distributed memories, we have some, we have, let's say, two processes, P and Q, that sit on two different nodes of machines such as Cray Blue Waters. Each of them has some local memory with some data in it. And now these two guys can communicate using remote operations by accessing directly each other memories. For example, we can issue a put that transfers a piece of local data to the remote memory, or a get that does the transfer in the other direction, or we can have also, we also need to issue a flush, which is, uh, because these operations are normally non-blocking for more performance, so we need to synchronize memories to ensure that actually these things happened and are committed. So, so the idea was to, let's basically implement pushing and pulling with RMA. And so, in the in this analysis here, we have a Kronecker synthetic graphs running on distributed memory Cray XC4T systems. Uh, two different graphs, I mean one plot for one graph. Uh, the parameters are as follows, so we have number of vertices, number of edges. Uh, X-axis is the scalability, so how many processes we are running this on. Y-axis is the time per iteration of page rank. And now we can see, like, so we have three variants for each of these, uh, for each of these mm, plots. So we have the pushing variant, the pulling variant, and message passing implemented with collective operations. And surprisingly, this pushing and pulling are done with RMA are really, really slow, with the pushing being the slowest, pulling a bit faster, and then message passing very fast. 
Right, so it turns out that pooling incurs much more communication, and it's actually much more communication heavy than this part here, that uses optimized uh, collective communication. And pushing is especially slow because we need to use expensive remote blocking protocols. So to update all these ranks, we need to run, uh, we need to, and these ranks are floating points, so we need to actually provide some underneath locking to, to do these remote updates, which is which turned out to be very expensive. And the collective are some, somewhat combining pushing and pulling, so we have these two things happening at the same time because all of the guys are receiving and sending something at the same time. And now for the triangle counting. So again, we have two plots for two, two graphs uh, that we count triangles on, again, the same, the same parameters on, the same labels on the axis. So we have number of processes and time, and the time to perform the whole triangle counting on a given graph. And this time you can see that uh, RMA is by far the fastest. And this is actually very interesting why is it the case. So we have more communication now happening, now happening due to message passing because we can't really now use collective operations in an as efficient way as before. And pushing now does not really require this expensive locking protocol because as we count triangles, we actually operate on integers, which means that we can use fast atomic operations for remote accesses provided by Cray, and which is what is giving this highest performance. And so what's the performance, right? So we have a couple of, uh, a couple of highlights. Uh, it's that pushing is faster if it's complexity lower, right? So we kind of have this uh, this, this results in the empirical analysis following the complexity results. So if uh, the complexity of, of a given one, of either the pulling or the pushing is lower, then the, the pushing is also going to be, to be faster. However, if our complexity is match, pulling is faster because again, we have this, uh, this overhead from more, more memory accesses. Uh, the performance and the read memories uh, varies depending on what mechanism we are using. Uh, and also we can use these strategies for having some consistent speed ups over a single variant of one algorithm across different graphs or different algorithms. And now there's the final question, do we want to push or to pull? And so if the complexity is matched, we want to use the variant which is using pulling. If the complexity is do not match, then we would like to do pushing because again, we have fewer memory accesses or communication in general. However, in each case, you should also check your hardware. For more results, you can check the, the report in the paper. And with the slide, I'd like to conclude. So in our project, we applied, we un tried to understand the applicability of pushing versus pulling for different graph algorithms. We try to understand also what, what is the nature of this dichotomy, uh, what are the formulations of different graph algorithms in each of these variants. And we also conducted complexity and performance analysis with some guidelines on what should be used in which case. Thank you for your attention.